We've this game appeared. We saw it first at PAX like a long time ago. I forget how many years ago. I'm and, pretty sure it was like in PAX West in like one of the little side rooms in the escalator area. Yeah, and it was like or out in the hallway, I think, in the escalator area. But and basically, it was like all it was all by itself. It was either at the time brand new. Or it was new to the U.S. Because I think the game comes from uh, Denmark. Yes, it's a Dutch game. It's apparently Danish, a popular Danish pub game. game in Denmark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, it's a uh, Danish game. But I'll admit, when I first saw it, for at least a couple of paxes, I straight up ignored it because I, I like air hockey. I'm a huge fan of air hockey. And I superficially looked at it and just thought, that just looks like tiny air hockey. Oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't ignore it. I, the first time I saw it, I sat down and demoed it and played it a bit. But I, and the only reason I never bought it was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry this back on the plane with yeah. me, really? Or where am I going to put this? Am I really going to play this thing? You know, all right, it's really cool, but... Well, because what I, I remember one? is you mentioned that you played it and that it was actually good, and I made a point. The oh, next time, yeah, it was good. Yeah, so the next time I was at a PAX, I made a point of going over and actually playing it, and that's when I learned what was good about it specifically, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but again, I had the same thought Scott did. Ooh, this is really fun. I could see myself playing this. I don't really want to put who? it in my suitcase. How often? Where? Yep. When? So fast forward further. Uh, every time I'm at a PAX from this point forward... I'd play it a few times if, like, I was walking by with people. And at the most recent PAX Unplugged, Emily and I and a bunch of our friends sat... Or, don't no, with PAX West, we did this. We sat down on our own at the Clask area because not the guy who invented Clask or, like, owns the company, but, like, the guy who, as best we could tell, runs the competitive scene in America for Clask. He was, like, running the table. So he didn't just, like, let us play... He facilitated our play, taught us techniques, and just like hung out with us for about an hour and a half while we all just played Clask over and over and over again. Uh, Emily is scarily good at Clask. Uh, she beats me reliably still. But uh, after that, I went from, I'd like to own this, but I don't want to fly home with it, to, I really want to own this, but I'm worried that it'll sit in my apartment and take up space. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Then, but then... Coming into my lap was a couple hundred dollars worth of uh, free money for Millennium Games, and I saw Clask MSRP just sitting right there, and I had a car, so I thought, you know what? Fuck it. And I got it, and we played it a bunch already. I'm getting better. I've learned some things about it, and I feel like Emily and I are intentionally going to cause the air hockey problem for ourselves in this game the same way you and I did unintentionally for air hockey. <laughs> So the game of Clask, what is up with this game? So you have this little table and you actually put your hand underneath the table and in your hand, you hold a magnet on a stick. A and strong on, magnet. Like it's a pretty yes, beefy it's, magnet. It's pretty strong. It's not like neodymium, but it's pretty strong. It goes, it's strong enough to go through wood. Yeah. Right? And so on top of the table, you have this sort of black pawn with a really tall hat um, and you put attach your magnet to that and you can move it around so it's like you know in air hockey or you know knock hockey it's sort of like your actual body has to go mm-hmm. into the field your arm or at least and that sort of can interfere with the game yep. whereas here because you're controlling this sort of avatar like a little athlete guy it's a little bit more like um what's the one with the spinny soccer guys Oh, foosball? Foosball. It's a little bit more like foosball, where like yep. or or uh, what's it called? Uh, air, uh, hockey with the you know with the sticks, the bubble hockey. I've always um, just called that bubble hockey. I don't know what is if slot hockey. I've I don't know what it's called what it, too. Yeah, but it's a little bit more like that, where you're sort of like remote controlling this guy. Um, you're you're and you're not interfering in any way, and so you move this. That's all you can do to play the game is move your hand with this magnet. You can't interfere with it in any other way it's not allowed right and so seems like it is just called bubble hockey slot hockey is not a common name for it all right so in the playing field you have this basically a circular indentation right it's sort of like a almost like a golf hole yeah it's not very shallow and there's a ball and if that ball the ball is not magnetic in any way so it's just a plastic ball and you can knock that ball around using your little guy, all right? So if you, you move your guy quickly and he hits the ball, you can hit the, right? And if you get the ball into the other person's indentation, it's a lot like the indentation on a crocodile. Yeah. And then you get a point for doing that. And so you're playing basically a hockey game. And 
underneath the table, you don't even need a rule for this because underneath the table, there is a wooden barrier. So you physically cannot get your guy past the halfway line yeah, because your hand, can't, your hand can't get through. It, there's no way to get over there. Right? Now, before we even get into the other rules, that alone is pretty air hockey adjacent. But even if there were no other rules, this introduces significant gameplay consequences that might not be obvious. So number one, games like air hockey where your hand's right in there, this also means your raw strength and power are directly applied to the game with no limits. So mm. in air hockey, one, that can lead to injury. Like I've hurt myself pretty badly playing air hockey before. But two, mm -hmm. it means if you're really strong or hyper aggressive, that can be a dominant strategy against someone who isn't super strong or isn't hyper aggressive. With the magnet system in a game like this, if you try to be hyper aggressive, your magnet will disconnect itself with your violence from your little guy and you kind of screw yourself. Or also the playing field is so small. Right, it's yeah. not like a big air hockey table where like the power has. Yeah, when I do a power shot in air hockey, I, it's like I'm swinging a sword as hard as I can with my whole body. Right, like what's the size of a class table? Like a foot, a little over a foot long. It's not, it's not that big. Yeah, right? less than two feet, I want to say. Um, and it's not very wide either. Maybe it's a foot wide by like maybe it's a legal piece of paper, a little bit bigger than that. A little bit bigger than that, A4? but it's small. Like it fits. And it fits, it's about this, it's smaller than our HTPC and it just fits next to it. Yeah, it's, it's not large. So you don't really have space to use that power. And even if you had more power, how would it help you, right? Yep. It's like the flick of a wrist is about max power in class. You yep. don't need more than that. It would make no sense. But Eric, because human... it's an indentation mm -hmm. uh, instead of a goal in air <laughs> hockey, if you hit the goal, it goes in, no matter how fast it's going here. If you hit the ball <clears> super fast, it's going to bounce right out of that little hole and you don't score anything. Yep, that's true. So it's about a deft right, hand. So it's about precision. Mm -hmm. Uh, and already, so this is significant, good gameplay just from those rules. Now there are additional And significantly rules. different from other games like it. Yep. And you're basically just play really simple, like pong rules, like first to six, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's it. So that's already a fun game, but then class goes to the next level and adds something extra, right? In the middle of the field are these three evenly spaced white little knoblies. And those knoblies have magnets in them. Well, the, but mm -hmm. very importantly, they have magnets on one side. Mm -hmm. They start mm -hmm. facing up on the top, and the other side does not have a magnet. So they are asymmetrical. That is very important. Yep. And so what's up with these? Well, obviously, they're obstacles. They can sort of get in the way of the ball and also get in the way of your guy. Yep. Right? Because they're, you know, it's like you try to hit the ball straight at their goal. If you hit it right down the middle, well, one of the things starts in the middle, so that's not going to work, right? Um, but two, there is a special rule, which is that if two of those little magnet guys become attached to your guy, right, you lose a point. The ball doesn't matter. It's an alternate victory condition. If two out of three of those are stuck to you, because remember, you're holding a magnet. Your do your player is yep. magnetic, and if you and even get close to these things, they start. You can see them like quivering in anticipation, and then yeah. if you get a little closer, they will fly at your guy and stick to him so fast you can't react to it. Yep, I mean it's the speed of magnets. It's faster than the speed of human muscles. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if two of them get stuck to you, you're in trouble. So, if you can send them into the other player's play area away from their starting position, the other player's movement will become very restricted. Like, let's say you get them all on, like, the left side of the other player's field, and then you try to bounce the ball off over into that area and try to bank it into the goal. How are they going to go to defend? If they try to go to defend, maybe they'll stop the ball from going in the goal. Maybe they won't. But if two of those things get stuck to them, that's the same as scoring a goal. Yep. So what do you care, right? You could put people in tough situations if you can knock those things to their side of the field. Um, let's say the other player is trying to play the ball, right, and like build up a shot. Just you know, meanwhile these three things are sitting in the middle of the field, just sitting there. The experts showed me that there is a technique where if you quickly approach and then back away from these things in a certain way due to magnetic fields being polarized, you can actually get near them and hit them, right, with enough, you know, speed and back up so that the force with which you hit them 
overpowers the initial magnetic attraction and you can actually send them and hit them at your opponent with some skill and technique if you practice it. I learned an get- even more advanced technique from the guy that we couldn't yep. execute, but now having the game at home, I can almost execute it where you don't even have to touch it. If you, if it's sitting somewhere magnet up and you go laterally across it as fa- at a certain speed, mm-hmm. then it will move towards you and it's like you shot it like a gun. So yep. if it's in your zone, you can use that to shoot it at the other side. But yep. that only applies if the little magnet, remember we said they're asymmetrical, is face up. If the magnets face down, they behave differently and they're kind mm-hmm. of repulsed at first and you have to use a different technique. So there is a, I guess, this is a long way of saying there is an extreme. And, extremely- and if they're on edge, they roll around. Yeah. So <laughs> there is a very like surprisingly high skill cap of advanced techniques around this game because of all these combinations of factors. Right. So the ball is really easy, right? Anyone understands that because it's not magnetic. You just sort of hit it, right? And that's it just obeys the laws of physics. But I guess the magnets also obey the laws of physics, but different, right? The magnetic laws, not the kinetic laws. Also the kinetic laws. Um, and so if you're like sitting there like trying to line up a shot, you're giving the other player a lot of time to mess with those things, like send them at you, right? If they're <laughs> skilled enough to use those techniques to send them at... It's like a risk reward, right? It's like... You got to go near those things to be able to attack with them, which puts you at risk of getting them stuck to yourself. But if you're good, if you're good at it, the risk significantly reduces and yeah, you can reliably just shoot them at the opponent. The the super good guy that we played with, he, at one point he was like, all right, let's sit down. I'm going to show, I'm going to show you the full extent of my power. And he was just like directing them around like he was psychic. It was amazing to behold. Yep. And so this is perfect, right? Because if you think about it, there's a lot of games out there that have multiple victory conditions, right? You know, um, I think about Magic the Gathering. You can do 20 damage, you can deck someone, or you can poison someone. Ah, I don't poison. Know they, My whole I don't know life they, was dedicated <laughs> in childhood to winning poison. I don't know poison. if that's still in the game or not. If they've poison is still of that. in Magic as far as I'm aware. Okay. And decking is definitely Some versions still in Magic. of Magic the Gathering this poison, and there might be some other Magic the Dude, Gathering poison variants came I don't out, know about. Poison was introduced in uh, way early. Like never. Regardless, right? There's at least two victory conditions. Right, you don't. You can go for. I, but you when you're in a game like, hmm? anyway, when you're when you're in a game like that, that has multiple victory conditions, you sort of have to pick one and go all in on it. Yeah, think about if a German tr- style like Euro point salad game. You're picking one. If you pick more than one, that is literally how you lose. Right. If you try to spread the wealth and go for both victory conditions at the same time, you're dedicating not enough resources to either one and so neither ends up getting completed someone else who dedicates their life solely to one victory condition will achieve it and therefore win while you're still halfway to two different conditions in Clask, it's real time and it's sporty all right and so the victory condition of get the ball into the hole and the victory condition of get two of these things attached to your opponent are happening simultaneously. And so if the ball is on the other opponent's side, you can work on, you know, getting magnets over to their side. And if the ball's over on your side, you can try to score a goal with it while they're maybe working their magnets. I, and, I have tried to do a thing. If you're right. really skilled, you can probably do all of those things all at once. So you're trying to go for all the victory conditions simultaneously at all times. And it ends up just being effectively unlimited fun like i could see this not having a cap on my interest yeah the key is not just that there's you know deep strategic depth to having two victory conditions and having to sort of juggle simultaneous offense and defense at all times but that it's fun for all players at all times Mm -hmm. because you are always doing something and you know in air hockey it's like Yes, yeah, sometimes you have the puck and sometimes you don't, right? And when you don't, you're just sort of standing there waiting to defend, yep. I guess. Or like even in ping pong, it's like, or tennis, it's like you hit the ball and like, yeah, you're looking where it's going. Yeah. It's going to come back pretty soon. You set up your position, but that's all you yeah. can set up. It's going to come back to you pretty soon, but that's still a very few seconds of like this downtime where you're thinking or whatever, right? In Clask, there is zero downtime. You are, if you want to be good at it at least, downtime is just hurting you. There is like, if you're not actively working the ball or the stones or both, 
you're just falling behind you know in like? your position. Advanced no FPS, what. like Overwatch is a good example. APM, if you're not constantly doing something, you're just a waste of space on your team. Right. And so there really isn't, you know, another game that's like kind of like that with the, with the, you know, constant action table sport doesn't actually require, you know, gr- big physical, yep. you know, skill. And I think you that, just, it's all fingers, wrist, you know, and a little bit of arm action. But that's it, also what I think is the magic here, that this game is not that big. Like, it does not take up any space in our apartment. It's small, and having bought one now, instead of just using the ones that are out at a PAX, it's super well-constructed. Like, mm-hmm. it's... The, this is not chintzy. It's very le- if it's not level, yep, it's your make, fault. It's not yeah, its fault. You should make sure you buy. There might be bootleg clasks. I don't know. Make sure you buy a legitimate one because the construction of it is extremely important. It's made out of like really solid wood. Yeah. Right. Um. You know the the pieces are very specific. So if you play with like some bootleg one, like the weights could be off, the magnetic strength could be off, the size of the ball and the weight of the ball might be off. Right. You need to get a legit clask. Um, right. It's not like, you know, a basketball where it's like, yeah, you don't actually need an NBA basketball. Yeah. You'll be fine with a college basketball or a high school basketball. Right? But also like Tumbling Dice, you- which is not actually that good a game. We just like it. That's like the re-release of that is like a hundred bucks MSRP. Uh, mm-hmm. Lots of physical games are very expensive for a lot of... Clask is 60 bucks. Like I've paid more for games that were just cardboard. Yep. yep. Now the other thing, right? Is that not only is there Clask, but some years ago they oh. came out with Clask Four Player. Yeah, which is I have not bucks. actually tried Clask Four Player. It is a circular arena instead of a rectangle, uh, and it has, I think, uh, five of the uh, obstacle. Yep, magnets. there's five shaped like the D, the five face of a D six, and the players are in a circle opposing each other, and everyone has their own goal. But they think there's still only one ball, right? Only one ball. Yeah, so you, I guess in that game, if the ball goes in your hole, that's bad. Um, I don't know the rules of like, if a ball goes in your hole, but then... Oh, here we go. I found get- the ri- mm. Everyone starts with five lives. The game ends when one player reaches zero. I see. So you could just die. Whenever anyone dies, do you stop playing and sort of reset the board? Yep, looks like whoever died kicks off. What if two? What if like? What if the ball goes in your hole and a second magnet grabs onto me and it's somewhat simultaneous and we don't have video? Oh, the replay? the rules from regular class. Uh, the, what I saw in that section. Uh, forgive me if I mischaracterize it because I'm just quoting from memory. It said effectively, if two actions that would cause a point to be scored occur simultaneously or are undifferentiable, redo it. Okay, uh, so it's okay to let it in your thing if you're. You know, if someone else dies at the same time. As long as it is truly simultaneous. I feel like it's a call on the table. Yeah, I would think so. You, like in you a know, pro it, tournament, it, obviously you're going to have a rep. They're going to have video case. replay in a pro tournament yeah. and it's going to be resolved, right? There are, I would suggest if you go on YouTube or the internet and look for Clask Pro Play, there's plenty of it to watch, right? This game has grown and gotten serious. Like there are people who are like really playing this for real. Uh, That's kind of why I want, I, we got it to play it and get good at it because... As much as I love air hockey, when I go to PAX, there ain't going to be an air hockey table there. Like, I have very yeah, few I don't know if the four-player class has too much serious competitive play because it can get political, yep. but the two-player class has, like, serious tournaments that happen. Um, you can, I think you can even win some prizes, maybe, if you become the best at class in the world. That Not, is, it can't be that big, but... But that's kind of why I got it at home. Much like having DDR at home, there's also DDR machine, at least there used to be in the wild. Clask at home means if I go to a PAX and there's a Clask, I could join the tournament or play against someone who's really good. There's a higher mm-hmm. chance of that than air hockey. Yep. I would also recommend if you buy a Clask, right, that <clears throat> they do sell a spare parts <clears throat> package that has extra balls, magnets, yep. pieces. Um, you're going to want to buy just buy at least one of those because you're going to lose a magnet you're gonna something's gonna happen you know a piece will get worn now, out or the something. default game <clears throat> does come with uh two extra of the little biscuits they're that's what they're yeah. called two okay. balls uh so yeah you have an extra you have an extra ball but the, and an extra biscuit yeah. but if you're really gonna if you don't play clask enough 
to burn through those spare parts and need more, yep. you didn't play the classic enough to be worth buying. Right? Unless you live in a tiny New York apartment where it's kind of impossible to lose a biscuit because there's not that many square feet it could go into. I guess unless I it like rolls under the molding into the wall, then it's gone forever. I suppose. You can, the other thing is, uh, another good thing to have if you're playing classic is an extending magnet stick because... If you drop pieces onto the ground other than the ball, you can retrieve biscuits and Ooh, things from that's from underneath the, from underneath the table with your extending magnet stick. That's uh, a good idea, and the that other... can help you stay that can help you stay seated while playing Clask. The other thing is that even if you don't permanently lose any of your pieces and need replacements, just having spare Clask parts next to you, it's like let's say you're playing a Clask and a biscuit goes flying into the kitchen. It's like, all right, you just grab a spare biscuit and you keep playing and you go later collecting all the ones yeah. that went flying. But like when you play ping pong, right. usually, unless you're playing in a super serious tournament, you're holding, if you're right-handed, you're holding two or three extra balls just in your left hand so you can just serve right away and not have to wait to pick up all the balls every point. Yeah, if you're playing tennis, there's <laughs> ball people around the, the edges of the court, right, who grab and toss new balls to you and, you know, yep. you even keep some in your pocket anyway. But when I was playing one-on-one so, -on -one tennis, like with my brother when we were kids, a lot of times we'd both just be holding the ball in our off hand just to be able to quickly get back to play. Yep. So that's a that's a good reason to buy a few extra Clask bits if you're going hard on the class. The last thing, if you're going hard on the class, I'd recommend you get is get a small pack of shims, like furniture shims, just so that whatever t whatever surface you put Clask on, you can level it appropriately because the game I is. I thought it best. came with a. I thought it came with a couple. It didn't come with any shims. It did. Go, well, it comes with the rule book, and the guy said, "Oh yeah, just use the rule book as a shim. Usually that'll uh. work." But yeah, the Clask, you, if you buy a legit Clask, all the ones that I've seen have been very well leveled and constructed. Yep. So if your table is level and smooth and your the building you're in is level and smooth, and etc., you shouldn't need any kind of shimmage going on. But yep. that is obviously not the case. You might bring your Clask somewhere. You might have a meh table. Who knows? There might be an earthquake. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah, you're going to want to somehow have some mechanism to level the clask, even by a really tiny little level, right? And so that way you can check to make sure the clask is, is flat when you set it up. Yeah, I don't think they've never used this in the Omegathon. I feel like this would be a really good Omegathon finale at some point. Really? It's never been Omegathon? I don't think it has been. If it has, I didn't see it. A oh. listener just asked, and I, my gut reaction was no, because I feel like I remember every Omega. It's been around around. like a long time, but I think it's worth talking about now, not just because you bought it recently, finally, but because I've seen it gaining steam over the years. It's only gotten bigger. Yep. Um, which is kind of surprising, right? That like you think that like this cute little game would be like sort of this novelty, right? Rather than like a long lasting thing and a scene built up around it and is is growing. So. Uh, you know, now it is like peak class, you know, even though it's at least man, you how too, old is your it search already? is like getting so I search for like just Clask Omegathon final and without saying, oh, well, class didn't appear in the search, it returned a video that is the video of Black Emperor. Oh, so thank you. Clask is Clask is from 2014, and so it's 10 years old. Another great reason to talk about Clask, oh. 10 year anniversary of Clask. Yeah, so uh, if any of you are out of PAX and there's a Clask, I'll play with you. Because uh, I want to show right. off that yep. I'm going to be slightly better than the average Clasker because I own it. Yep. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening theme.